What's up, everybody? I'm the Goji Ryu Philosopher, and one of my absolute all-time favorite things to do is style comparison. As long as we avoid bashing people's styles or lineages, or writing off whole arts as being completely ineffective, then I could spend all day, every day, talking about the relative strengths and the relative weaknesses of different martial arts. Unless you practice a meridote, there's always going to be some style that practices something a little bit better than the way that you do it. That's also one of the most interesting parts of the modern rise of MMA, and is one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to Jerry from Fight Commentary Breakdowns for always posting style versus style bouts, where you can see whether or not a certain training method knows how to counter another, and both arts and fighters get to learn and grow as a result. Karate has a long history of taking techniques from other martial arts and adapting them to their practice, just like any other martial art that wants to stay relevant in the modern world. Miyagi Chojun went and sought out several different styles of Chinese martial arts in order to expand his knowledge of fighting, and once famously said that karate had to be opened to the fighting styles of the world to receive their criticism and feedback. Historical karateka such as Motobu Choki, as well as modern practitioners like Kikuno Katsunori, sought out bouts with boxers, judoka, and other pugilists from both Japan and around the world. Not every similarity that karate has with other styles is a secret hint that really derives from that style, but karateka have been seeking out and comparing their style against others since well before the foundation of even the most ancient karate styles. So this video was inspired by someone who I met on a Discord server who helped me get digital copies of quite a few different books and has generally provided me with quite a bit of knowledge. You see, while us karate buffs might know that karate originated in Okinawa rather than mainland Japan, on the world stage, karate is generally seen as being a Japanese martial art, and that means that it has to compare itself against other Japanese martial arts. And quite frankly, the easiest comparison to make is with the style that gave karate its ranking system, as well as its uniform, the gi. The other famous empty-handed martial art from Japan, judo. While most people tend to think of judo as a throwing and grappling art, both judo and the Japanese jiu-jitsu styles from which it originated include quite a few punches, kicks, elbows, and even headbutts. While competitive judoka may be known for setting up and then executing some magnificent throws and pins, the Kodokan still teaches a number of different striking techniques that look a lot like karate's assortment of tsukis and uchis and keris. Most of us karateka nowadays know that karate has, at least historically, always had a wide assortment of throws and grappling techniques, but we still tend to overlook the fact that judo had, and still does have, an assortment of atemiwaza, the striking techniques for which karate is primarily known. So today, as part of a two-parter, I want to take a look at those striking techniques and do a little theoretical style versus style comparison of my own, comparing how judo's atemiwaza stack up against karate strikes. Let's, as always, get into it. The term judo was originally one of the many terms that Japanese martial artists used to refer to the unarmed martial arts of the Edo period, but it became its most famous through Kano Jigoro, a student of many different styles of Japanese jiu-jitsu who synthesized them into a new style that would sweep Japan after the Meiji Restoration. Kano-sensei studied a number of different styles of koryu jiu-jitsu, including Tenjin Shinryu and Kitoryu, the latter of which is famous for being the style that Bruce Lee defeats in Fists of Fury, and he received the transmission of Kitoryu, as well as significant recognition from his other styles in which he trained. Kano's education in Kitoryu specifically is said to be the foundation for the Nagewaza, or throwing techniques, for which judo is primarily known nowadays. Tenjin Shinyoryu, on the other hand, placed a much bigger influence on pins and ground techniques, making it a natural complement for Kano-sensei's education. And of course, both of these styles focused very heavily on Atemiwaza. Kano-sensei began teaching at the Eishoji, a Buddhist temple in Tokyo, in 1882, and his school would later become known as the Kodokan, not to be confused, of course, with the Matayoshi Kobudo Kodokan. At first, this was a Kitoryu Jujutsu school with some additional elements added in from Kano-sensei's time training in Tenjin Shinyoryu, and Kano-sensei would eventually receive the Densho, or Scroll of Transmission, for the Kitoryu style, making Judo the official successor to that art. Over time, Kano's Kodokan became more and more popular, and his students began having competitions with students of other schools and competitions against local police academies. With the popularity of his style, however, came detractors, 
and eventually several other dojos would partake in Dojo Yaburi, storming the Kodokan and challenging some of Kano-sensei's students to unsanctioned bouts with few or no rules. Between 1886 and 1888, these sporadic challenges would escalate into full-on tournaments. While Kano's school, which was by this point calling itself judo, experienced several notable losses in these tournaments, overall they were victorious in these bouts more often than not, which would eventually result in Kodokan judo becoming very popular as well as officially sponsored by many police departments across Tokyo, which would in turn lead to the other Koryu styles of jujitsu fading into relative obscurity from then on out. While this result was beneficial for Kano and for the development of judo, it unexpectedly ended up being a tragedy for Japan's native striking arts. Judo competitions and their randori only allow for nagewaza and katamewaza, throws and pins. Striking techniques in judo are generally limited to their kata, as well as occasionally showing up in their practice of goshinjutsu, which is the judo term for self-defense. The result is that most judoka, who have ended up being at least partially motivated by sport, whether it be because they personally enjoy competing or because their dojo requires competition, haven't really learned the atemiwaza of judo in much depth. However, those techniques are still present, and there are still a few judoka who are dedicated to preserving the historical form of judo, and who continue to teach their atemiwaza in their dojos. And just as an aside, an interesting note that didn't really fit anywhere else in this section is that one of the students that Kano-sensei sent to travel the world in order to spread judo, a bid that would introduce some of these judoka to the powerful wrestlers in Britain and America, would eventually travel to Brazil, where he would encounter the Gracie family and pass the art of what was still being called at that time jujitsu into the hands that would make it known as one of the strongest grappling arts worldwide. All right, all right. So now that the history's out of the way, it's time to take a look at the actual striking that still exists in judo and see how it stacks up. Clearly, most of the focus in judo is placed on their throws, and even though their curriculum and their randori allow for some newaza, or ground grappling techniques, the fact that a single decisive throw can result in an ippon victory in a competition means that their ground game isn't as developed as, say, BJJ. There are quite a few interesting videos out there of judoka practicing their striking, either as part of the kime no kata, or as part of some freestyle practice, but for the purposes of completeness, I'm going to be making use of the strikes that are noted in a book that my very knowledgeable friend sent over, called My Method of Self-Defense by Kawaishi Mikinosuke. Kawaishi-sensei appears to have had a passing familiarity with karate, although he mistakenly refers to it as having been a part of jujitsu, but his judo credentials are incredibly solid. Kawaishi was a key figure in the promulgation of judo to Europe, particularly in France, where he was laid to rest after his passing in 1969, at which point he was posthumously awarded a 10th dan in judo, having previously held a 7th dan. His book that I'm going to be working from is divided into two sections, one of which focuses on a more traditional judo repertoire of throws and joint locks, although it also includes some prohibited finger and small joint locks, and one that comprises the latter half of the book, which focuses specifically on his atemiwaza. So, getting started. Us karateka are generally familiar with the idea of vital points, or kyusho, the areas on the body that are the most vulnerable to being struck. Depending on how spiritual you want to get, these points are sometimes said to be related or even the same as the points that are used in acupuncture, moxibustion, and shiatsu massage practice. Whether or not you believe in the finer points of meridian theory, however, these points are still the most vulnerable anatomical points against which you should direct your attacks and Kawaishi helpfully gives us several diagrams of their locations. Like many of the karate books that I've been able to get my hands on, most notably Higao Namorio's books, this diagram is accompanied with a few diagrams and explanations of how these points can be most effectively struck, and what the expected effects are should they be. And now, getting into the actual striking first, we've got some hand strikes. Although karate would generally start with punches with a closed fist, Kawaishi talks first about Atemi with the open hand. He first starts with what are probably the most high-risk strikes in all of martial arts, those being fingertip atemi to the eyes and to the throat, as well as discussing how to use the bridge between the thumb and the forefinger in order to press against the nose or the throat. In this section, he also demonstrates the tegatana, or hand-sword technique, which is bound to look familiar to us karateka, which he says is targeted best against the neck and the face, or occasionally against the sides. So a lot of these techniques are recognizably extant in karate. The fingertip strike is incredibly similar to karate's nukite techniques, although his illustrations demonstrate that he applies this with the palm facing down, 
whereas in karate it's traditionally held straight up and down vertical or at a slight angle. The Shuto in karate, which is written with the same characters as Teikatana, is also sometimes thought to be used to strike these targets, most notably the neck, but there is some ongoing debate as to whether most interpretations of Shuto are designed to be strikes, or whether they're actually supposed to be part of karate's kansetsu waza, the joint techniques. So far, the only recognizable outlier in these techniques is the fork of the hand technique, which I personally have seen used in some karate, but only in some of the most obscure kata that are specific to my lineage and my style. Fortunately, however, it's time to get to the punches. Kawaiishi presents strikes with the first knuckles, the base knuckles, as well as the base of the fist, all of which are strikes that are seen in karate, although the first of which is seen much more rarely due to being incredibly difficult to pull off. However, in terms of the standard fist, there is a slight difference in that Kawaiishi recommends striking with the base knuckles of the index, middle, and ring finger, whereas most karateka that I know tend to train to strike only with the index and middle finger's knuckles. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, a punch is a punch is a punch, and it's interesting to note that one of the diagrams shows what appears to be a judoka striking a karate-style makiwara. Kawaishi does take care to note that the joint between the phalanges and the metacarpals, in layman's terms, the base knuckles, are the most preferable target for striking with, and he recommends twisting the punch as it lands, the same way that a lot of karate styles do. So these punches are, by and large, almost exactly the same as karate punches, with the notable exception that Kawaishi never mentions any sort of hook or uppercut or undercut technique. I'll skip really briefly over the elbow strike section, since they're basically the same in Kawaishi's judo as in almost every karate style that I've seen, and go straight to our first really big major difference, which is a temi that uses the head. Using the head to strike is something that's rarely found in karate, and even though I've heard a few explanations of kata bunkai, that include using headbutts, I've yet to see a single one of them practiced or officially drilled, or even included in an official technique list. Headbutts in this book are primarily presented as a type of defensive atemi against a waist hold, either from in front or from behind. Due to the increased potential for head injury to the performer, these techniques are generally banned in most MMA styles nowadays, although certain combat styles, most notably Lethway, have kept them in their competitive rule set. Next up, we've got the section on knee strikes of which Kawaiishi presents two varieties, a frontal knee strike and a dropping knee to injure a pinned or downed opponent. This frontal knee strike technique is presented in a superficially very similar way to the way that karate does its knee strikes, although the foot seems to be held in a natural position rather than flexed, and of course, there aren't any rounded knees to the side. Of course, most of the karate dojos that I've visited don't practice those kind of dropping knee strikes, since they seem designed to supplement the pins and ground techniques that are present but often overlooked in many styles of karate. However, those techniques are actually present in karate, and exist in quite a few different kata. And last but not least, we've got some kicks. While certain historical karateka have touted kicks with their toe tips, those are so uncommon in modern training that I'm not actually going to count their absence in this manuscript as being a difference from karate. With that said, Kawaishi presents three main kicking surfaces. The ball of the foot, the heel of the foot, and the instep all of which are found in various karate kicks. The most obvious of all kicks, the front kick, seems to be shared between karate and judo, including both variations with the ball of the foot and with the heel. Kawaishi also mentions my personal second favorite kick, the fumikomigeri, better known as a stomp. And lastly, the instep is suggested for groin kicks, but also for a series of kicks from the ground that very closely resemble a kanibasami-style takedown. Aside from, of course, headbutts, these kicks are actually one of the biggest differences between judo striking and karate striking. Karate includes some kicks with the shin to the side of the body and to the knees, a few very specific kicks with the sole of the foot, and of course a large number of kicks with the blade of the foot, including my personal number one favorite kick, the kansetsugeri, or the kick to the inside or sometimes outside of the knee joint. The other big difference may just be a result of the way the diagrams for this book were drawn, but it seems as though judo approaches the mechanics of the front kick much differently than karate. Almost all of the front kicks demonstrated in this book appear to arc the shin out straight from the knee, a technique that many styles of karate would call keage, and most of my senseis would call wrong. While one of the heel kicks seems to maybe move in a straight line, the text of the book never mentions the sort of pistoning motion that karate's keikomi kicks use, a type of motion that in my experience allows the kick to generate superior amounts of power, 
and which allows Karate Kid to adapt more naturally to the teep, a sort of variation on the front kick famous for Muay Thai that uses a pushing rather than a striking motion. Instead, all of Judo's front kicks seem to be keage, or snap kicks, which tend to be a little bit faster, but sacrifice a lot of their power as a result. Alright, so now we have our blow-by-blow, blow, and we know which techniques that Judo's atemimaza has in common with karate, as well as most of the techniques that they don't. So now it's time to judge the quality of Judo's striking, and see if it's really just as good at striking as karate is. The answer, of course, is no. Not in my opinion, at least. We can come to this conclusion in two different ways. First, by looking at what techniques they claim as part of their curriculum, and second, by taking a look at the actual proficiency of their practitioners. On the first count, while Judo may have an impressive arsenal of strikes, they seem to be missing some of the most important strikes from karate. For one thing, no mention is made of round punches like hooks, uppercuts, and undercuts, which are incredibly effective at ending fights, as we've been shown time and time again by boxing and by MMA. The punches that they do have seem to be exactly as good as karate's punches, and they do certainly have a variety of different fist shapes and types, but unfortunately, that variety comes in the type of fist shapes that are the least useful in modern fighting. Moreover, and this is the really important one, Judo is missing a lot of kicks when compared to karate. Quality of technique is more important than quantity of techniques, of course, but not including kicks that target the knees seems to be an incredibly big oversight, especially for a martial art that's all about taking someone's balance away from them. There are technically a few kicks to the back of the knee that Judo seems to include, but these seem to be more designed to force the knee to bend than they are to injure it, and there are so few of them that it seems like the knee as a potential target is almost an afterthought more than a valid target in Judo. Now, I do want to make an allowance for the fact that some of the omitted striking techniques in this book might be due to the fact that it didn't have enough time or enough space to go 100% into detail about the minutia of every little strike in Judo's Atemiwaza curriculum, but the fact that it chose certain very specific and very useful strikes to leave out is rather telling about the overall quality. Then, on the second count, it's incredibly clear that most judoka simply are not the equal of karateka when it comes to striking. Since atemiwaza are prohibited in competitive judo, it is incredibly rare to see a judo practitioner who can hold their own when it comes to striking and defending against strikes, since they simply don't practice it as much. Additionally, judoka who participate in mixed martial arts or in competitions against other styles tend to end up supplementing their art with striking from Muay Thai, boxing, or even sometimes karate. Of course, that isn't to say that judo is completely unable to produce competent fighters who are capable of holding their own in striking. Omigawa Michihiro, whose primary style is judo, has had a difficult but formidable career in professional MMA, and has won by knockout as many times as he's won by submission. But judo's atemiwaza, while they are useful and effective, simply do not stack up to karate's strikes. In my opinion. They do have a speed when it comes to throws and grappling, though. Thank you so much for watching this comparison between judo's striking and karate's striking. I hope that you found it informative, since I personally had brain worms that wouldn't let me rest until I'd written a whole video about it. If you appreciated this video, there are some YouTube buttons that you can use to say that you liked it, and a text box down below them where you can let me know what other styles you think might even